My name is Ashley Wu, and I'm a fourth year student here at UC Davis. I am also a coordinator for the pre-health conference this year. Um, I want to thank the, the Double AMC for sponsoring this event and making it available online to everyone. Without them, this conference would not be possible. I am honored to introduce our speaker for the day, or just for our keynote speaker, Ms. Stephanie P. Vandermeulen, the president of the Physician, as a, Physician Assistant Education Association, the, which is the national organization representing physician assistant educational programs in the United States. Ms. Vandermeulen completed her undergraduate education at Wayne State College and her Master of Physician Assistant Studies degree from the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Her clinical expertise includes family medicine and orthopedic surgery. She is currently pursuing a PhD in gerontology at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, and she is a member of Sigma Phi Omega, the National Honor Society for Gerontology. She served two terms as director at large at, on the Physician Assistant Education, uh, Education Association Board of Directors and was recently elected the position of president-elect with a term beginning in January 2015. Without further ado, it is my honor to present to you the president of the Physician Assistant Education Association, Ms. Stephanie P. Vandermeulen. Thank you. So it was a clear, crisp day, in fall day in Nebraska. The sky was a brilliant blue, and it contrasted perfectly with the green hue of the turf and the crimson uniforms worn by our team. The smell of leaves and the electric excitement of a rivalry football were in the air. I was standing on the sidelines in the thick of the action. As a PA working in orthopedic surgery and sports medicine, one of my duties was to provide medical coverage for a local university. From my vantage point, I could hear everything. The call of every play, the smack talk between the players and their opponents, the urging, prodding voices of the coaches to their players, the roar of the crowd, and the words of congratulations when the players came off the field after a successful offensive drive. The sounds of a football team are, or a football game are almost musical. They come together like a symphony, waxing and waning, building and receding. But with one particular play that day, the music changed abruptly. It was second down, the players lined up, the whistle blew, and the center snapped the ball. Above the noise of pads clashing and the grunts of 300-pound linemen, one sound rose above the rest. A resounding snap that sounded like a gunshot was followed by a wail. And not just any wail. This was a wail, the loud, desperate cry of someone who is hurt, someone who's really hurt. The play on the field stopped, and people rushed to the side of our quarterback, Troy. He was clutching his leg and rolling around, and it quickly became evident from a distance that there was something very wrong with him. As the medical team rushed to his side, it became apparent to us that he had a tibia fracture. His lower leg was dangling in a very unnatural way, and he was in agony. Working with the team physicians, we stabilized the leg and waved for the ambulance parked at the edge of the field. As paramedics crowded around to apply a field splint and load him onto the gurney, I moved to Troy's head. He was breathing fast and his eyes were wild. He was searching frantically, but focusing on nothing. He was terrified and he was in pain. I'm sure his football career was flashing before his eyes in that moment. Troy was a redshirt freshman from a state far away, and because his family was hundreds of miles away, they weren't able to attend his games. He was hurt and scared, and he was feeling very alone in that moment. So I reached down and I took his hand, and I spoke loudly to him until I could get him to focus on my face, and then, once he stopped thrashing around and calmed down a little bit, I lowered my voice and I reassured him that things were gonna be okay. As we loaded him into the ambulance, I kept talking to him, and the more we talked, the more calm he became. I rode the ambulance with him to the hospital where we would later operate on him. On the way, as the sirens wailed, I dialed his mom on the phone. After reassuring her, of course, that everything was okay, that he was hurt, but he was okay, I handed the phone to him. And as he took that phone from my hand, his tears started to fall. And I watched a big, strong, strapping, fearless football player melt into someone's little boy. Those are the moments that a PA gets to see. Excitement and electricity abruptly change to pain, and pain transformed to vulnerability and fear. As a PA, you jump in and act. You don't think, you don't plan, you just simply use your training and skills and the expertise that you, that you have to respond to what is needed in that moment. Troy's leg was broken, and of course it needed to be stabilized, and of course we're trained to do that. But that day, in that moment, Troy needed something else. 
He needed someone to hold his hand and to help him navigate his fear and his pain. And he needed to talk to his mom. Later that night, we took Troy to surgery and placed a titanium rod in his leg to stabilize it. I was in contact with his parents, and together with Troy and the rest of the medical team, we made decisions about his care. Casting the leg was an option, but surgery offered the best chance at quicker healing and proper alignment of the fracture. The surgery went well, and I left the hospital that night with Troy in the caring hands of the hospital's nursing staff. The next morning on rounds, the doctor and I stepped into his room. Troy was sleeping comfortably, and the sunshine was streaming in the window. By this time, his parents had arrived, and they were sitting at his bedside, looking very tired and very haggard from the trip in. When I introduced myself, a light came into Troy's mother's eyes. She leapt from her chair and threw her arms around me and hugged me tight and said, thank you so much for being there for him. I have no idea what I would have done if I, if I hadn't known that you were there with him. As a PA, those are the moments that drive you. Those are the moments that remind you why you do what you do. PAs practice more than just medicine. We practice patient-centered care. Patients are more to us than just the pneumonia in room 235. We build relationships with our patients that are built in trust. Troy's, patients trusted, or Troy's parents trusted us to care for him until they could arrive. Together, we made decisions about how best to treat his injury, Placing the rod in, the leg, in his leg would give him the best chance to heal quickly and return to collegiate football. His goals helped to drive the decisions that were made about his care, and he trusted his medical team to make that happen for him. Troy did return to playing collegiate football, and he was able to finish his college football career. He was a success story, and those are the high points of a, a PA's medical career. But unfortunately, with the highs also sometimes come the lows. As a newly graduated PA, I practiced in family medicine in a small rural town in north central Nebraska. Uh, Atkinson, Nebraska has a population of 1,200 people. When people from Atkinson want to go to the big city, they drive 90 miles to the nearest town of any size, and it has 25,000 people in it. Three physicians and I shared the responsibility for the health care of that small community in the surrounding rural area. Being on call meant that you had to be prepared for anything anything that came through the doors. When the call came in that an ambulance was en route, you had no idea what to expect, but you had to be prepared for anything. One such call came on a Wednesday afternoon. It was an overcast day and I had a clinic full of patients. A nurse quietly knocked on the door of the exam room that I was in and interrupted the visit. An ambulance was coming, ETA 10 minutes. There was an accident out on Highway 275 and there was one person coming in en route, very badly injured. I finished up the visit and joined the on-call physician as he ran across the parking lot to the hospital. We donned gowns and gloves and stepped into the ambulance bay to wait. And that kind of waiting is the worst. You stand there with nervous energy, your hands twitching with nothing to do, looking at each other, shifting your weight, really with nothing to say to each other. In a town of 1,200 people, you know everyone. Who is the patient going to be? Someone you sat behind in church this week? A patient you saw in clinic yesterday, a stranger passing through town, an old man, a little boy. The crescendo of the sirens grew as the ambulance approached, and as the back doors opened, we recognized the patient immediately. Mike was a well-known member of the community. He's not a, he wasn't a civic leader or a prominent businessman, but a salt-of-the-earth kind of guy who grew up in this town and stayed there to raise a family. He and his wife worked on the family farm, and they had four children and the family was well known to our clinic. Mike was in very bad shape. He'd been driving his pickup along a two-lane highway, two highway, and an oncoming garbage truck had lost his brakes and hit him head on at full speed. His body was broken in every conceivable way. Closed head injury, multiple fractures, internal bleeding, collapsed lungs. He was hanging on by the smallest of threads. The team leapt into action, intubating him, starting IVs, hooking up monitors, getting medications on board, drawing blood to type for transfusions. The scene was hectic, but everyone had a job. We were racing to save his life, but things were looking very bleak. As we frantically tried to keep Mike alive while we waited for the arrival of a medical helicopter that would transport Mike the 200 miles to the nearest trauma center, a nurse stepped into the room. Somebody needed to go talk to Mike's wife, Rose. The physician looked up from the x-ray he was looking at on the wall and gave me the nod. It was going to be me. 
that was by far the hardest conversation I've ever had as a, as a PA, and probably as a person as well. I walked into the family room where Rose sat alone, puffy-eyed, and wringing a Kleenex in her hands. She looked up at me with these pleading, hopeful eyes, a look that begged for me to give her some good news, but I didn't have any to give. Mike's injuries were grave. Even if he survived the flight to Lincoln, he had a long road ahead of him, and he was never going to be the same. As I shared with Rose the seriousness of Mike's condition, I saw hope leave her eyes, replaced by despair and sorrow. At some point, the words I said no longer had any meaning to Rose. She succumbed to the emotions and simply sobbed. And I sat beside her on that couch for what seemed like an eternity and just held her in my arms while she cried. While she mourned everything that was gonna leave her, her life. Her best friend, her lover, the father of her four children, the rock of her family, the center of her world was slipping away from her. And as the rest of the team worked on, I just held Rose and I cried with her. And when the helicopter arrived, I walked her to Mike's side where she would say her last goodbye to him. Mike died on the way to Lincoln. <laughs> as you can tell, that was almost 18 years ago and it still affects me to this day. His injuries were just too severe. Several days later, I attended his funeral, and I have to admit I was very nervous about going in. I didn't know how Mike's family would react. Would they blame me? Would they wish that we had done something more to save him? Would they be angry? I almost didn't go in because I almost felt like my presence there would cause them more hurt or more anger, and they didn't need that in that moment of sorrow. And as I was standing outside and I turned to go away, Mike's brother walked up to me and embraced me in probably the biggest hug that I've ever had. And he thanked me. He thanked me. In a moment when a family is delved into the deepest depths of grief, the emotion they felt towards me was gratitude. I was very humbled by that. Being a PA is a privilege. It's a privilege to be admitted into the most personal moments in the lives of your patients. It's a privilege to be trusted to fight the battle for someone else's life. To use your skills and knowledge in that critical moment when every minute counts and a life hangs in the balance. PAs have been fighting those battles and saving lives for more than 50 years. The PA profession has its roots in the military and the first three PAs were Navy corpsmen. And many early PAs were combat, med combat medics and corpsmen, trained to save lives under harsh and unforgiving battlefield conditions. The culture of acting as a first responder, responder is still deeply embedded in the PA profession. When two bombs were detonated near the finish line of the Boston Marathon in April of 2013, two of the first medical professionals to rush to the site were PAs, volunteering their time and expertise for this event. Whether on the battlefield, or after mass casualties, or after traumatic accidents, PAs demonstrate their resolve to provide passionate medical care to those in need. As a PA student, you're required to rotate through a number of clinical clerkships. You've probably heard a fair bit about this, and maybe you've done some investigation and learned a little bit about the process of PA education. And one of the required uh, clerkships in the program that I attended was obstetrics, which is the care of pregnant women. So this was one of my favorite rotations, and I'll never forget the first time I was present for a baby being born. I was, since I was a student, the obstetrician required that I stay with this couple from the time they hit the labor and delivery room doors until that baby was born. The couple's names were Clint and Sasha. It was 20 years ago, and I still remember their names. <laughs> um, and I had seen Sasha once before at her last visit to the doctor before the baby came. She was pleasant and sweet and bubbly and very excited about her first baby. Clint, however, was the epitome of the manly man. He was big burly guy, bigger, you know, taller, over six feet tall. He was a firefighter for the local fire, a fire department. He was very somber and he was a man of few words. He was clearly very nervous and he spent much of the day mostly just sitting in the corner looking very serious about things. Watching quietly, never far away, but definitely keeping to himself with a clenched jaw and a very furrowed brow. He was very serious about the whole thing. So labor progressed as expected and it was time to push. The nurses instructed Clint on where they wanted him and he took up his place at her side. The focus was on her, but other than a few words of encouragement and occasional kiss on Sasha's forehead, he was quiet. Sasha pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. And at first a little crown of hair began to show and then finally with one big push, a baby girl came into the world. 
And it doesn't matter how many times I see a delivery or I'm involved in a delivery, it's still as exciting today as it was that very first time that baby came into the world. So the doctor quickly swept up the, uh, swept the baby onto Sasha's stomach and wrapped her in a blanket with only her little face peeking out of, this, out of the blanket. And as Clint gazed upon that little bundle of joy for the first time, his face changed completely. That stony look that I had seen all day melted into a smile of pure joy and pure elation. He was dumbstruck, as he said to Sasha, is that our baby? Is that our baby? And he let out the biggest whoop I have ever heard, and nurses from three doors down came to check and make sure everything was okay. I'm not really sure whose baby he thought it was if it wasn't theirs, given that he was standing there and, and witnessed the delivery, but yes, that was indeed their baby. And, and he and Sasha laughed and cried tears of joys that, and covered that little girl in kisses. Those are also the moments that define your career. It's a privilege to witness those private moments of joy. It's a privilege to be a PA. So the stories that I've told you are just a small sampling of the wide collections of experiences that I've had as a PA. I've told you these stories to illustrate a remarkable feature of the PA profession. We're trained as generalists in, med in medicine. This gives us an initial and critical focus on primary care. Millions of additional people are now gaining financial access to health care, and their first interaction in with the health care system will typically be in a primary care setting. The PA's generalist education makes them particularly well-suited to respond to the increasing needs of a growing number of patients who have a wide variety of health care needs. But we're also able to specialize and change specialties as needed. I'm a perfect example of that. I worked for a few years in family medicine, and then I worked in orthopedic and sports medicine. PAs are like the stem cells of medicine, able to adapt to local health care needs. The flexibility of the PA to change specialties is unique and invaluable among all the healthcare professions. It allows us to build a much more effective healthcare system by responding quickly to the different specialties and the needs of the healthcare system. This combination, a generalist education and flexible specialization, makes ours the ideal profession to help solve the healthcare crisis in America. The shortage of healthcare providers overall, and particularly the shortage in medically and underserved communities, requires us to educate more competent and compassionate PAs to respond to the country's health care needs. As president-elect of the Physician Assistant Education Association, I represent 187 PA programs, and there are probably 40 or 50 more that are coming online in the next few years. That's a lot of spots that are open and available to all of you in the audience if you're interested in this profession. Over the yesterday and today, I'm sure you'll learn a lot more about the nuts and bolts about how to apply and what PA school is like and what it's like to be a PA. But if you want to practice patient-centered medicine, meet the challenges of, a providing, of providing primary care, and experience the flexibility of working in, a different special, in different specialties over the course of your career, then the physician assistant career is right for you. We need you, and America needs you. Thank you. <laughs>